Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Aaron Ravine, and I'm the Engagement Director of the William F. Buckley Jr. Program. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to this afternoon's Supreme Court Roundup. If I may, I'd like to say a few words about the Buckley Program and the format for all of us today. Uh, the William F. Buckley Jr. Program is the flagship of the Buckley Institute, an organization dedicated to promoting intellectual diversity and open political discussion at Yale. We have hosted lectures, dinners, debates, and conferences every year since 2011. Our over 550 Buckley Fellows have a wide range of political beliefs, but they all stand united against the formation of a liberal-only echo chamber on campus. By providing Yale students with a forum to engage meaningfully with serious conservative thought, the Buckley program has become an institution on Yale's campus, and it's a symbol for more open and representative political atmosphere. Especially at a university where the mission is the cultivation and creation of new knowledge, uh, the Buckley Fellows believe that all perspectives must be heard and examined in good faith. You can learn more about the program and how to become a fellow on our website at thebuckleyinstitute.com. For today's event, after introducing our guests, I'll turn things over to them for opening remarks. After those, I'll throw out a few questions and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. So now for our panelists. Uh, Mr. Ed Whelan, who's uh, all the way down there, uh, is the is a distinguished senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center and holds the EPPC's uh, Antonin Scalia Chair in Constitutional Studies. He is the longest serving president in its history, having held the position from March 2004 through January 2021. That's quite a while. Uh, Mr. Whelan directs the EPC EPPC's program on the Constitution, the courts, and the culture. His areas of expertise include constitutional law and the judicial confirmation process. As a contributor to National Review Online's Bench Memos blog, Mr. Whelan has, a, ha, has been a leading commentator on nominations in the, to the Supreme Court and on the lower courts and issues of constitutional law. In his Confirmation Tales newsletter, he draws lessons from his three decades of experience in judicial confirmation battles. Mr. Whelan, a lawyer and a former law clerk to Justice Scalia, has served in positions of responsibility in all three branches of the federal government, from just before the terrorist attacks of September 11th, which we just remembered a few days ago, uh, until joining the EPPC in 2004. Mr. Whelan has been worked in the capacity of the Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General, that's a mouthful, for the Office of Legal, Legal Counsel in the DOJ. In that capacity, he advised the White House Counsel's Office, the AG, and other senior DOJ officials, and departments and agencies throughout the executive branch on difficult and sensitive legal questions. Mr. Whelan previously served on Capitol Hill as General Counsel of the Senate Committee on the Judiciary, and in addition to clerking for Justice Scalia, he was a law clerk for Judge Clifford Wallace of the U.S. Court of Appeals of, for the Ninth Circuit. Now for Mr. Kenneth Marcus, who's here uh, the closest to me, is the founder and chairman of the Louis D. Brandeis Center for Human Rights Under Law. Disting and he's the Distinguished Senior Fellow for the Center of Liberty and Law at George Mason University's Antonin Scalia Law School and the author of The Definition of Anti-Semitism and Jewish Identity and the Civil Rights in America. During his public service career, Marcus served as Assistant U.S. Secretary of Education for Civil Rights, Staff Director for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, and General Deputy Assistant U.S. Secretary of Housing and Urban Development for Fair Housing and Equal Op and Opportunity. Uh, in academia, he formerly held the Little and the Lily and Nathan Ackerman Chair in Equality and Justice in America at CUNY's Bernard M. Branch College School of Public Affairs and served as visiting research professor at, in, of political science at Yeshiva. He is a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Contemporary uh, Antisemitism and previously served as associate editor for the Journal of, of the Journal for the Study of Antisemitism. Earlier in his career, Mr. Marcus was a litigation partner in two major law firms where he conducted complex commercial and constitutional litigation. He also currently chairs the executive committee of the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Civil Rights Practice Group. Now for Anastasia Borden. Uh, she is the director of the Robert A. Levi Center for Constitutional Studies. Before joining the Cato Institute, she was a civil rights attorney at the Pacific Legal, Legal Foundation, where she led their Equality and Opportunity program. She also co-created the podcast DIST, which tells the story behind infamous Supreme Court dissents. In her decade before Cato, Bo uh, Bowden represented entrepreneurs in challenges to onerous lic licensing laws, anti-competitive restrictions, and certificate of need programs. 
uh, and her cases have led to legislative reform in Montana, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. Among her, among her other wins are a case involving uh, bucking uh, in invalidating busking restrictions in Houston. Uh, several appellate decisions opening up the, co the courthouse doors to civil rights plaintiffs and the legislative repeal of Virginia's happy hour advertising restrictions. Her writings have been featured in the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the LA Times, the Tribune, Forbes, and more. And she has appeared on Headline News, Reason TV, Newsmax, and John Stossel. She earned her BA with Dean's Honors from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and her JD from George, Georgetown University Law Center, where she was a research assistant to, profess, to Professor Randy E. Barnett, the intellectual godfather of the constitutional challenge to Obamacare. Now, without further ado, I hope you'll join me in welcoming our guests to the Buckley Program and to Yale. Please. Shall I? Um, well, thank you, thank, and thank you all for that uh, great uh, welcome. I appreciate the uh, introduction. It's an honor to be here at uh, Yale at the Buckley Institute uh, and uh, with uh, Ed and Anastasia. Uh, I find lately that I'm often on panels with people that I've been on panels with for years and years and years, and I'll tell you this is the first time I've had the honor of being um, uh, on a panel with uh, Ed and Anastasia, which may explain their willingness to be here today. Um, I guess I, since I founded an organization, the Louis D. Brandeis Center, which combats anti-Semitism, I should also just say a word of gratitude for William F. Buckley Jr., who I think more than anyone in the conservative movement made a real um, campaign out of uh, el eliminating uh, anti-Semitism from the conservative movement as best he could, and did it not just uh, with one or two perfunctory remarks, but with, um, I would say, a consistent and courageous uh, action. So I'm. Uh, especially proud to be here at an institute uh, named uh, named for him. So uh, I've been asked to discuss uh, students for fair admissions versus Harvard and uh, students for fair admissions or SFFA versus the University of North Carolina. Uh, my guess is that if you're familiar with one Supreme Court case from this past term, it is the Harvard and University of North Carolina affirmative action cases. They are a case. They are also, I would say, a social phenomenon. Uh, in these two SFFA uh, cases. Uh, the Supreme Court, as you may recall, uh, invalidated or struck down the use of race uh, as a factor in admissions at both the University of North Carolina and Harvard. You may boo when I say Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> Very nicely done. <laughs> I usually don't have to, in my college appearances, ask people to boo, but I think, uh, I think this is, uh, I think this is uh, very nice as well. So it was struck down as a violation of the Equal Protection Clause and Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits discrimination in programs or activities that receive federal funds, uh, which includes uh, nearly every college uh, and uh, university within the United States, as well as, as, well as public schools. The Supreme Court uh, reasoned that the programs at Harvard and the University of North Carolina uh, had a negative impact uh, based on race, uh, used uh, invidious stereotypes uh, based on race, uh, and failed to set a specific timetable uh, for their elimination. Uh, in the lead up to the decision from the court, there had been, I would say, a widespread belief that the court would uh, strike down the Harvard and UNC uh, admissions policies, but disagreement about whether it would be a narrow win or a big win. That is to say, would the court simply find that these two programs uh, impermissibly used race, or would there be a bigger opinion which essentially says that race cannot be a factor in admissions um, based on the rationale uh, that uh, uh, the educational benefits that flow from multi-factor diversity uh, are a compelling interest. In fact, it is widely accepted that this was the big win that conservative activists had asked for. It is not written in sweeping terms. Uh, if you uh, read it uh, afresh without knowing the background, uh, you might wonder why is it that Chief Justice Roberts, in his majority opinion, distinguishes the Fisher case rather than overturns it? Why is it that there is a lack of very bold language? The language is often that of an incrementalist, and yet, as I think is fairly broadly understood. Uh, the programs 
uh, at Harvard and UNC uh, that were found unconstitutional use the same sorts of rationales that virtually every college and university uses. And having found them unconstitutional, it is unlikely, with some small exceptions, that any would survive scrutiny. Those exceptions might include military academies, which the court explicitly reserved for another day. They might include uh, involuntary use of race, for instance, schools that are using uh, racial preferences based on consent decrees um, or based on uh, resolution agreements with other aspects of the federal government. Those might be left for another day. But generally speaking, there is a wide acknowledgment, I would say. And yet there remains a question, to what extent will this be uh, a watershed moment? Or to what extent will there be something comparable, at least in forceful resistance, uh, not to say in, 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 in other respects, from ma the massive resistance which postponed the effect of Brown versus Board of Education for so many years. In other words, will universities and employers and others simply say, okay, we get it, the Supreme Court has spoken, or will they find lots of different ways around it? I don't think that we yet know, but I think that there are some indications that there are some going in two different directions. There are some institutions that have made clear that they get it. The University of North Carolina, for instance, one of the losing uh, parties, uh, has made statements that very clearly adopt the race-blind uh, suggestions of the Supreme uh, Court. Uh, Yale University has uh, recently changed policies in a way that suggests that it is accepting uh, the Supreme Court's uh, decisions. Um, uh, just within the last week, uh, one of my former law firms, Morrison and Forster, uh, after a, another lawsuit from uh, Edward Bloom, uh, the mastermind behind the SFFA cases, Morrison and Forster agreed to get rid of uh, the use of race in some of its fellowships. There are many institutions that seem to be uh, indicating that they get it and that they will no longer intentionally use racial preferences in uh, admissions or hiring. However, there are other institutions that seem to be doing something uh, different, that seem to be taking a narrower approach or perhaps using essays uh, or other ways of trying to give an advantage to some on the basis of race. For instance, Sarah Lawrence University, in a particularly cheeky uh, approach to the court, um, added a new question uh, to their uh, applications. They gave as an optional essay, they quoted Chief Justice Roberts as saying, Chief Justice Roberts writes that nothing in this opinion can prevent a college from considering a student's discussion of his own race to demonstrate how he's overcome uh, uh, d diversity or something along those lines. Now, Yale actually just did the same thing a few did, days ago. Did it really? Yeah. Well, I wonder if Yale did it in the same embarrassing way as Sarah Lawrence because the quote from Sarah Lawrence turns out not from uh, Chief Justice Roberts but rather from uh, the syllabus at the beginning, which is a little bit like turning a paper that qu quotes uh, Moby Dick, but in fact it's the Spark Notes version of, of, of Moby Dick. <laughs> But beyond that, it doesn't note that what Roberts actually said in part is that you can do indirectly what you're not able to do directly and that colleges may not replicate through essays a system that they're not otherwise able to use. So I think that there are some who are using a very narrow and sometimes um, error-filled approach that will lead to further litigation down the road. But there is some, I guess, preliminary indication that many institutions, both in higher education and elsewhere, are starting to see the tea leaves. I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you. Thanks to the Buckley Institute for having me here. Um, it's really nice. Usually when I'm on panels, I'm on a panel with one other person, and they've cabined me into either the right or the left seat, whatever they think a libertarian is, which I think actually is a good indicator why you should all love libertarianism, because we keep, we're keeping you guessing, and we could really fit into uh, either seat depending on the, uh, the topic. But I'm glad here to, to have a seat just for libertarianism and, and to, uh, to showcase uh, viewpoint diversity. So I'm going to talk to you about Biden versus, versus Nebraska. This is probably a case of particular interest to you all since it involves uh, student loans. 
But unfortunately, the, the court, as you may know, struck Biden's loan forgiveness program down. This was the administration's $400 billion loan forgiveness program, which offered up to $20,000 in forgiveness per borrower, making up to $125,000 per year. And six states and two individuals who didn't qualify for various reasons for the forgiveness sued on the theory that the Secretary of Education lacked the power to do this with the flick of his pen, that really that decision belonged with Congress not with an unelected bureaucrat. Um, now, the secretary had justified this program on the theory that it was necessary to uh, prevent any harm that was coming from the COVID-19 emergency and was befalling borrowers and putting them in a really rough spot in terms of paying their loans back. But notably, the plan came just weeks before the Biden uh, administration declared the COVID-19 emergency over. It came after Congress affirmatively considered and decided to reject loan forgiveness. And it came after Biden ran on a platform of loan forgiveness, which I think made a lot of people, and I think ultimately the court very skeptical of the Secretary of Education's reasoning here, relying on this national emergency statute, when in reality it seemed more like um, a political aim that the administration wasn't able to, to shovel through Congress and instead was doing through uh, an, a bureaucrat. So another remarkable thing about this case was that basically the government had said throughout the entire time, even though many, many people had sued, was that nobody could bring a lawsuit to challenge it. They said nobody was sufficiently injured um, to make their way into court to challenge this multi-billion dollar program. Uh, but in this case, the court finally ended up accepting that at least one person had standing, and that was the state of Missouri, because they had sued on behalf of Mohila, which is a government uh, loan servicer, and Mohila was gonna lose about $44 million in fees because of these loans being forgiven, and so finally, uh, we have a plaintiff here, although Justice Kagan, in the end, uh, in her dissent, she ends up saying that she thinks this is the court just granting standing to a party because they wanted to get to the merits of the issue. Um, I happen to favor broad standing rules that is allowing civil rights plaintiffs into court as much as possible. I sued the government for 10 years and they very, very often, I did not expect the bulk of my practice to be arguing whether you can even set foot in a courtroom. Um, but often that is the case and I think, you know, people should be able to come into courts and hold the government's feet to the fire, but take it for what it's worth, you know, it's the Cato Institute speaking here. Um, so in, in any event, now that we have one plaintiff who can go into the court, what did the court decide on the merits? So it, it was evaluating whether the secretary had authority to pass this uh, or to issue a, a loan relief based on the HEROES Act. The HEROES Act was a post 9-11 act that was uh, made permanent after the Iraq War, which was intended to make sure that victims of these emergencies or uh, people in the military and Navy were not having a hardship because of these widespread national emergencies that either affected them directly or maybe they had to go ship off and were now having problems repaying their loans. So after it was enacted, we, we get an example of what we thought the Secretary of Education thought it meant because he was doing small things like waiving certain provisions. You know, maybe you had to have uninterrupted, servi uh, uninterrupted service for a period of time um, in order to get loan forgiveness. And the Secretary had shortened that a little bit or said you, don't have, you no longer have to fill out certain forms because it's a hardship because you're overseas, et cetera, et cetera. And the question is here, can the Secretary just wipe out billions of dollars in student loan debt? Um, under the same statute. Is that a proper exercise of the power? A and as uh, Chief Justice Roberts wrote in a 6-3 opinion, that is six justices ruling against student loan uh, forgiveness and three in dissent, the, the secretary does have the power to waive or modify the student loan program, but he does not have the, pr the power to rewrite the program entirely. It's unlikely that Congress would have authorized such a broad sweeping power with such narrow language, only authorizing the secretary to waive or modify, not to rewrite, not some broader term. Um, it's really just an abuse of that term, essentially. And to quote Justice Scalia, Congress does not hide elephants in mouse holes. Where Congress wants uh, the administrative state, different bureaucrats to be able to do something, it's gonna say so. It's not gonna hide some really, really big power under some really, really narrow language. Um, so although the court 
did resolve the question based on normal interpretation. I think a big thing in the legal movement was that Chief Justice Roberts also said that this decision was bolstered by what's called the major questions doctrine. And this is an interpretive canon that says that where there's an issue of vast and significant economic or political significance. Congress can be expected to give clear authority to agencies. It, it just requires judges to take a little bit more of a closer look and to make sure that, that there was a true delegation of power. And this has various policy um, rationales. For example, it makes sure that the big decisions stay with Congress, our elected representatives who must consider everybody's interests where it's, there's a lot more gridlock, and that's for a reason, right? The founders wanted gridlock to make it difficult to get, to get big uh, uh, laws passed that wouldn't you know, throw our country into to disarray just based on the whim of, of the electorate. Um, it also makes sure that Congress isn't delegating its authority, which it has an interest in doing, to these unelected bureaucrats so it can get away with these uh, policies and having no accountability for it. You know, they are our elected branch, they are the ones who are ultimately accountable, and they're the ones who should be making these decisions rather than kind of allowing uh, the administrative agencies to do their dirty work. Um, I'll just note one more thing, which is that uh, Justice Barrett wrote a concurrence where she defends this major questions doctrine because Justice Kagan and some of the liberal justices have said that this is a made up judicial doctrine that the conservative judges are just using to, to interpret laws in a way to take away power from the administrative state. And Justice Parrott says, no, this is just a normal way of how we understand language. You know, we understand that, for example, um, if, a, if let's say parents give their kids the keys to the car and they say you can take the car and use it to do home improvement. We might assume that the parents intended to allow those kids to go to Home Depot and buy some paint. We would not assume that those parents meant that they could sell the car and use that money to renovate the entire house, right? This is just the way that we understand language. It's not made up. It's a very reasonable textualist um, uh, a canon of interpretation. And I'll also, also note that she used, uh, Justice Barrett used two hypotheticals that very closely tracked hypotheticals that the Cato Institute had written in their amicus brief to the court, which we submitted urging the court to, to rule the way that it did. And you know, one, that would raise some eyebrows, but two hypotheticals that tracked ours, mm -hmm. I mean, I can't, I can't say that she read it, but it's interesting. Um, so in any event, um, Justice, Chief Justice Roberts closed his opinion saying, you know, reasonable minds can differ. In fact, three reasonable minds did differ. They dissented, right? And we're not going to take the dissenters' very heartfelt words to be uh, casting aspersions on the majority or suggesting that, you know, the court's illegitimate or something like that. Um, because I think Chief Justice Roberts has in mind maintaining the legitimacy of the court and also um, allowing dissent without saying that just because people disagree they are somehow not actually engaging in judicial interpretation or they're doing something that's pure partisan politics. He really wants to play all of that down. So he said at the end, you know, there is a very vigorous dissent here, but we're going to take it in good faith and say that they're not casting aspersions on us. They're just dissenting vigorously. Um, and, ju and Justice Kagan did in fact dissent very vigorously, accusing the court of overreach, of doing what it wanted to do um, politically. Um, but I think, you know, I always encourage people to read the opinions for themselves. Some of them can be quite interesting. Judges have even started using, I don't know, Star Wars references, popular culture references and whatnot. Um, and I think you can, you can judge for yourself whether the opinion's legitimate. I happen to think that, that uh, the majority does a very good defense of statutory interpretation um, to say that what's radical is not the majority's decision, but the, uh, an unelected bureaucrat's a decision to, with one flick of the pen, write off $400 billion in debt. Um, but I always suggest people read them for, their, for themselves. But with that, I wait for your questions, and I'll pass it along to Ed. Thank you, Anastasia. It's wonderful to be here with the Buckley Institute. As a parent of four kids, I'm so grateful that um, various institutions have what I call havens of sanity <laughs> that counter the craziness that can occur uh, uh, elsewhere uh, in the university. I know my two kids who have made it through our system of longer education and the two who are currently in it have benefited so much from institutions like this one. I'm going to be discussing a third uh, ruling from last term, a case that 
was especially controversial, I guess, after it was decided, um, for curious reasons I'll uh, address. This is a case of 303 Creative v. Elinas. Uh, this was a case coming out of Colorado. It involves a clash between First Amendment speech rights and so-called public accommodations laws. Uh, some brief background. The Colorado Anti-Discrimination Act prohibits businesses from discriminating on various grounds, including sexual orientation. Lori Smith runs a website design business called 303 Creative, sometimes I'll refer to Lori Smith or Smith, sometimes 303 Creative for purposes here, they're, they're interchangeable. She wanted to expand her business to offer wedding websites, but she was concerned that state officials would charge her for violating the act if she offered only wedding websites uh, for weddings between a man and a woman. So way back in 2016, more than seven years ago, she sued state officials and sought an injunction to prevent them from punishing her. The court ruled uh, by a vote of six to three that she had a First Amendment speech right to uh, engage uh, in the service that she wanted to engage in and to provide only uh, websites for weddings between a man and a woman. Justice Gorsuch, in his, in his majority opinion, relied on the longstanding principle that the First Amendment protects someone from being compelled by the government to express speech that she objects to. This is a principle most famously uh, set forth in the flag case, uh, West Virginia Board of Education v. Barnett. He went on to, to explain that the wedding websites that Smith uh, sought to create qualify as pure speech protected by the First Amendment. The stipulations between the parties, uh, um, between Smith and, and Colorado, uh, is essentially set that forth. That, that is, that this is, this is speech. As a condition of offering wedding websites celebrating marriages she endorses, Colorado sought to compel her to ce celebrate other marriages that she didn't. And that's a flat violation of First Amendment speech guarantees. Gorsuch went on to uh, explain what Colorado's position would mean if it were adopted. As he put it, the government could require an unwilling Muslim movie director to make a film with a Zionist message or require an atheist muralist to accept a commission celebrating evangelical zeal, so long as it make films or murals for other members of the public with different messages. He said that they point out the government could force a gay website designer to design websites for an organization that advocates against same-sex marriage. Now, I've seen a lot of far-fetched claims about what the 303 creative ruling supposedly means, but I haven't seen anyone answer Gorsuch's examples. Let's talk about what the ruling does mean. In an excellent post by Dale Carpenter, a gay libertarian law professor who submitted an amicus brief in support of 303 Creative. And he explained that as he understood the ruling, and he, look, he admitted there's some, some questions at the margin as to what exactly it means, but a vendor cannot be compelled by the government to create customized and expressive products that constitute the vendor's own expression where the vendor's objection is to the message contained in the product itself not to the identity or status of the customer. Now, th these formulas can be a little difficult to digest uh, in, uh, immediately. Uh, his point is that this, uh, hold, this holding would apply um, very narrowly. It, does, uh, you know, it is not as expansive as uh, a lot of the folks uh, screaming bloody murder would suggest. As he points out, almost all products are neither customized nor expressive. They have to be both in order to, to um, satisfy the test. And most customized products are not expressive at all. Now, I've seen some law professors claim that 303 Creative would enable a restaurant to claim that its food is expressive and to decline to serve customers on that basis. But a menu is the opposite of customized. It's like buying an off-the-shelf wedding cake, to use um, an example that in the Masterpiece, Master uh, Cake Bake Shop case, Masterpiece Bake Shop, I guess it is, everyone agreed that, of course, um, the fellow there who objected to creating customized um, cakes for weddings would provide them on, off the shelf. And it's also difficult to see how a restaurant meal is, is expressive. So while there might be some difficult questions as to which customized products um, count as expressive, uh, th this case in no way establishes a sweeping rule that some of its critics pretend. Indeed, the stipulations in the, in the case made this 
uh, case very easy, and I'm surprised it wasn't nine to nothing. Among other things, the parties agreed that Smith would serve customers irrespective of sexual orientation, that she would never create expressions in her designs on anything that contradict her views, for example, by promoting violence, and that the wedding websites that she planned to create would express her view of what marriage is. Now, it's possible to be, uh, to be sure that speech and conduct that's beyond the scope of 303 creative might be protected under other constitutional guarantees, for example, under the Free Exercise Clause, but this case itself um, d doesn't uh, address those issues. Now, right as this case was being issued, uh, there was a big brouhaha in the media um, claiming that this was a phony case, a fake case, because it turns out that um, a request that Smith received the day after she filed her complaint, uh, in the immediate wake of, of, na of national media attention uh, to, 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 the, to her complaint, um, th there's this request uh, asking for her to make uh, a, a cake for a same-sex wedding. Uh, and this, turn, this turns out to have been a sham request. Well, this sham request played no role at all uh, in the court's reasoning in the case and in, in the, in the, the uh, Tenth Circuit's decision below that standing existed. Yet somehow um, this became a vehicle for casting all sorts of aspersions, including on the attorneys in this case, who there's no plausible reason to think that they were involved in uh, submitting this sham request. It's most plausible that this was a prank by someone who saw that this complaint had been filed and wanted to make trouble um, for, uh, um, uh, for Smith. You know, if you're actually going to try to concoct standing, does this actually matter? You don't wait till after you file your complaint to, 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 to make this request because you need to have standing at the time that the complaint is filed. So uh, I can go into that. Uh, maybe you all heard about that, but it's really a silly, um, a silly um, argument. It's um, well established that all that's needed for standing is a credible threat of enforcement. In this case, the very parties she sued were the parties who um, she said would enforce this against her. And they did not, they didn't deny it. They, they didn't say, no, we promise we won't. You can go ahead and do this. Uh, and, and indeed, the history of, of this masterpiece uh, uh, case showed how aggressive these Colorado authorities are uh, in, uh, in applying this Anti-Discrimination Act. Pre-enforcement challenges, which you have here, are common. They played a major role in civil rights litigation. And it's beyond bizarre to see the left in this case um, suggesting that uh, standing did not exist. So with that, I, I will f um, happy to address uh, more. Aaron, take yeah. it here. Thank you, guys. Uh, why don't we give our guests a brief round of applause? <laughs> so. I'm going to begin with a few questions that I've come prepared with. And in the meanwhile, uh, how about all you start to think of your questions? So one thing that came up um, in throughout your comments, all of your comments, was the question of the legitimacy of the court. So I, for one, have been quite happy with this iteration of the Roberts Court. It's a lot of rulings that I personally agree with quite strongly. But the public doesn't always agree with me, and I, that is unfortunate. But uh, when it comes to legitimacy, uh, it seems like that's kind of a something that we should always care about, but isn't always clearly defined. And because it's not clearly defined, it isn't always clear what exactly we can do to maintain said legitimacy. From your perspectives, uh, as academics who study the court and have kind of an outside perspective on how other people think about the court, what would you guys say would be a good way to maybe support the legitimacy of the Supreme Court, given these conservative victories? And any of you can start. Why don't we start with you, Mr. Marcus? Um, sure. Um, I, just an observation. I don't know if this supports or undermines the legitimacy of the court. But I'll tell you, just about a month ago, I had the opportunity to uh, uh, testify in, before the Knesset on the day after the um, Israeli parliament uh, voted in favor of a very substantial uh, judicial reform package that was extremely controversial uh, on the left in Israel. Um, the left in Israel was supporting uh, the uh, prerogative of the judiciary to undertake various actions that are breathtakingly greater than anything done in the, in the United States. For instance, to uh, reject 
uh, nominees uh, from the uh, prime minister based on reasonableness, that it was unreasonable uh, to uh, select this or that uh, candidate, uh, or to strike down uh, statutes of the Knesset, not because they're inconsistent with the Constitution, Israel doesn't have a written uh, Constitution, but because they are unreasonable and therefore inconsistent with the so-called basic law in Israel. There, what's interesting is that it is the left insisting on the legitimacy of a court that is far more active than the U.S. Supreme Court has uh, ever done, whereas the right on the other side. So here we have in the United States and Israel, even if you just look at Jewish intellectuals in both places, you have... Um, uh, diametrically opposite views on the legitimacy of the court and of efforts to curtail it. From which I infer that in both places, it's not really about uh, views of what the court is doing or not. It's really outcome determinative. That is to say, those who object to what the court is doing uh, will cast doubts on its legitimacy, which are really, in a lot of cases, not really about uh, who paid for Clarence Thomas's uh, a trip to uh, Alaska, uh, or whether the standing rules were bent uh, in a particular case or not, but rather simply about um, a, a party uh, that does not control the nomination for judges uh, being upset uh, that their people are not uh, there. So it seems to me not really about the legitimacy of the court so much as it is, at base, a substantive ideological differ difference. Yeah, I, I would add to that. You know, it's frustrating because I think the court is actually doing all it can do um, to avoid these critiques. And if you look at the term closely, it's a shockingly narrow term. It's a term in which the court refused to rule on a bunch of cases. And there were some cases with major issues, and the court sidestepped them completely because it didn't want to deal with them. Um, it's a term where the court is taking fewer cases than ever. You know, you would think by, by all these criticisms that they're overstepping and accepting more and more cases and making their docket bigger to, to rule our lives. But in reality, the, the court's taking about half as many cases as it took uh, just a few decades ago. And within the term, it's taking cases that are really very boring, a bunch of statutory cases that nobody, you know, we're talking about three cases here, and even the big ones are just a handful of, of the docket. Um, and so, and then, you know, and then Ch Chief Justice Roberts, he's crafting narrow opinions. The Harvard decision, whether you think it's actually narrow or not, he was very careful to say, hey, I'm not ruling about all racial preferences. I'm ruling about racial preferences um, at UNC and at Harvard. And because they have these particular characteristics, they're unconstitutional. So anyway, it's all to say, I think the court really is endeavoring to maintain its legitimacy, and it's just not working. And that's, uh, that's probably a little bit uh, emblematic of a larger cultural uh, phenomenon that's going on, where we have the tendency to criticize people we disagree with and saying that they are, you know, this or that, uh, ignorant or or illegitimate or what have you, um, rather than just dissenters. They're just, you know, just they're just disagreeing, and reasonable minds can disagree. So I think, you know, one thing that we can do to maintain the the legitimacy the legitimacy of the court is to also maintain the legitimacy of dissent broader in our society and to, you know, engage with people with different viewpoints and, and not call them names um, and, uh, you know, and just to, to foster dissent. And then one other thing I'll say, I don't really oppose some moderate reforms on the court, like term limits or something like that, you know, that would require a constitutional amendment. But, um, you know, if it's going to really appease people, then I wouldn't oppose it. I just don't think it actually will appease people because I do think that this is really outcome oriented rather than a serious critique of, of the court. Well, legitimacy is a sort of woolly concept. I think I have a much more optimistic view than Anastasia does of the current perceptions of the court's legitimacy. But let me, um, try to uh, address sort of what I understand the, the, the term to um, plausibly mean. Um, look, I think the first question in assessing um, a Supreme Court ruling is, did they get it right or not? Now that question in turn requires you to figure out what's a proper method, method of interpreting the Constitution, what does it mean? And uh, I'm very ready to say that there are some interpretations of the Constitution that are so far beyond the bounds of what is plausible that th those rulings uh, you know, call into question their own legitimacy and uh, a whole pattern of them I call into play the courts. And I think the Warren Court you know, as, as, is, uh, was really skating on thin ice with its rulings. The, the ruling in Roe versus Wade 
uh, I think is very difficult to defend as a plausible interpretation of the Constitution. And what's ironic here is that I think so much of the attack on the court has really come out of the Dobbs case. Um, the, the, the left um, for so long was counting on the, on the court to um, maintain this misconstrued abortion right. And uh, obviously there's a lot of um, uh, passion uh, directed at the, the overturning of Roe and the restoration of abortion policy to the democratic processes. But talk about illegitimate, I mean, look at Roe. <laughs> uh, so so I, uh, like I think that when there's discussion of um, legitimacy, uh, we ought to challenge people to say, well, what do you mean by that? Now, um, and, and you know, are you saying that this opinion is not only wrong, but not a plausible interpretation of the Constitution? Are you saying that the membership, the composition of this court is somehow legitimate for some sort of reason, as though um, you know, uh, compliance with the formal mechanisms of nomination, Senate confirmation, and appointment um, you know, aren't sufficient? Look, this is, a, it's, this is, this is losers whining. Um, and um, we, you know, we, we should not, um, you know, we should not uh, credit it at all. Uh, and look, a lot of the losers are in powerful positions. They have loud voices, uh, some of them here at Yale. Um, uh, but um, I, I think the whole, this whole notion of, uh, of any serious question about the court's legitimacy needs to be um, just um, contested and refuted. Yeah, and I just have one. Thank you, thank you guys for your comments. I, I have one last question, and then I'll pat, turn it over to our audience. I want to ask you guys about trajectory. So originalism now seems to be ascendant. Uh, one of the cases that you guys didn't mention was the ISL case, which actually came down as like a loss for conservatives. But even that majority opinion was done using originalist reasoning. Um, but the thing that seemed to animate a lot of originalist advocacy for much of its history it was, was Roe. Uh, as as was mentioned before, um, so Rose gone now. Uh, where are the originalists going? Are they going after the administrative state? Are they going after like free exercise clause uh, jurisprudence? Where do you guys see the trajectory of the court in the next few years heading toward? And please, anyway. well, I'll start off this one if you like, and we'll go, go in reverse order. Um, look, this is not a. Uh, we do not have a majority of thoroughly originalist justices. And indeed, in a, in a system in which you have a landscape out there defined by um, decades of, of liberal rulings, um, and when you consider that there are some genuine stare decisis, you know, adherence to precedent concerns, uh, it'd be very, very difficult to, to actually have that. I, I, I guess I might rephrase the question, where is the conservative legal movement going? Uh, understand the conservative legal movement as a loose coalition of, of groups with very different priorities. Gun folks, libertarians, pro-lifers, religious conservatives, you know, business interests. Uh, and um, you know, I think there's going to be some jockeying um, for position among some of those groups. Right now, uh, I think I identify two major targets of the conservative legal movement. One is the administrative state. Uh, specifically, um, uh, the so-called Chevron Doctrine, which is a, a doctrine of deference to an agency's interpretation of, um, of the laws that it administers, basically says that where those interpretations are reasonable, the courts will defer. This actually is a, a, is a um, rule uh, that Justice Scalia um, vigorously favored. So, you know, it's a question of uh, the conservative legal movement seems to be changing on issues involving the deep state or, or the bureaucracy. There's, uh, relatedly, is the question of uh, uh, non-delegation. Pardon me. Uh, question whether um, the Congress, there are limits on how, uh, how much authority Congress can delegate to administrative agencies. Now, I've been around long enough now, unfortunately. I, my sense is every 30 years, people think, aha, let's, let's revive the non-delegation doctrine, and they stumble around for a while and figure out that, oh, they really can't do it in any coherent way. I have to say, I'm skeptical how much will really be accomplished um, in this administrative law area. I think, ultimately, there will need to be deference to administrative agencies, and we need to have a president who not only attacks the deep state in tweets, 
um, but actually understands how to run a government. Um, the second area where I think the conservative legal movement might be going is on um, free exercise principles and on limiting the scope of a case called Employment Division versus Smith that um, basically holds that where a law is neutral and generally applicable, um, there is no free exercise claim against it. Um, that's already been cut back in, in many different ways, and some are calling for outright overruling. We'll see, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I think Ed's right that there's no one place because that the that originalism is going it, because so much of the Constitution has been written out of the Constitution. Um, this is like, yeah, the, we're banging the war drum outside on bringing the Constitution back. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's there's just so many things that the Supreme Court could still do to bring back the original uh, public meaning of the Constitution. <laughs> right on cue. Um, so. Uh, a big procession of, 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 of uh, faculty, it looks like. So. Oh, fun. Well, <laughs> should we take Very a break cool. while it pa passes, or, or can you talk through this? I think you guys just continue. All right, I'll, I'll uh, speak up. Um, so in any event, as Ed said, that the people will be jockeying for where the movement should go next. I will put in my own plug, which is overturning the slaughterhouse cases. These were one of the first cases to interpret the 14th Amendment, uh, which came out of the Civil War, of course. And it effectively, I mean, pretty much everyone agrees, no matter what political persuasion you have uh, or, or even form of interpretation, I think everyone would agree that slaughterhouse was wrong because it essentially wrote the Privileges or Immunities Clause out of the Constitution, and that was meant to give uh, very strong protections to civil rights. Um, and it's because that provision has been written out of the Constitution that we've seen the court over the years since then try to cabin all substantive rights into the Due Process Clause. And that's created a lot of the havoc and a lot of the um, disagreement between uh, judicial conservatives or judicial progressives. Um, and I think we could undo a lot of that mess if we just got back to the original meaning of the Privileges or Immunities Clause. And we could also give greater protection to rights like the right to earn a living, which basically gets zero respect in our constitutional order, even though it was one of the, the rights that, that the framers of the 14th Amendment most intended to protect. Um, and I'll just add for full disclosure that I have a case pending before the Supreme Court. We're asking the Supreme Court to take that very question up on behalf of a woman who wants to serve special needs kids in New Orleans, um, in Louisiana, incidentally where Slaughterhouse came out of. Um, but they kept her out of that occupation because they said her business wasn't needed. Um, and if they don't, they just, they willy nilly keep 70% of the people out of that occupation each year because it makes their job easier. And they said that the easier their job, the better they can regulate, which the better for all of us. And that's the only reason they are keeping this woman out of an occupation. And the lower court said, that's just fine because your right to earn a living enjoys almost no protection under the constitution. I think that's all wrong. I think the framers of the 14th amendment would be horrified given that was one of the central civil rights they were trying to grant people in the wake of the Civil War. Um, and so anyway, I will lobby for that to be where uh, originalism takes us next. Yeah, I mean, I don't see the either the court reaching to find a particular next issue, nor do I see within the conservative movement any consensus on a particular issue. I would personally like to see, you know, a, a, another examination of uh, uh, the Commerce Clause under an originalist uh, perspective, um, but I don't see a whole line of people uh, saying yes. That's pretty, make that one, uh, make that one next. Uh, when it comes to the conservative movement, to follow on um, uh, Ed's reformulation of the question, I think there's a real issue of whether the conservative movement will remain. Uh, as unified as it, as it has been behind uh, originalism, uh, not only after the successes in cases like uh, Dobbs, uh, but also after the failure in cases like Fostock, where an originalist uh, approach didn't seem to get the results that conservatives wanted. And so I think that we've already seen a little bit of a distancing among some young conservatives, um, in, in some cases an attraction to either uh, so-called common good um, constitutionalism or other approaches that seek um, uh, something beyond uh, the uh, original meaning uh, and there, there are different iterations from it. So I would not be surprised to see other strands in conservative constitutional um, 
thinking come up uh, in the future. Now, it's not exactly an answer, but could I, could I say that there's one issue maybe suggested by both of my colleagues that I think every smart conservative would agree with, but then there's me. So I think, uh, if I may, so, and I don't know how much was Anastasia as opposed to the court, but Anastasia said something every conservative would, would agree with, I think, uh, in suggesting that when Congress delegates power to the uh, administrative state, uh, it has to do so uh, very explicitly, and we need to interpret it, I would say, narrowly, uh, for fear that otherwise the administrative state uh, will uh, come up with uh, uh, much greater powers. And I think there might have been a similar a thought behind uh, Ed's uh, discussion of, of, of Chevron uh, in the interpretation. So what I would say is I agree about 80% uh, with this general notion, but there's one area where I'm not entirely sold. So let me say first why I agree, the 80%. Um, critical, I think, uh, that democratically elected uh, officials uh, have the, uh, the key word. Critically important uh, that there be a division of uh, powers between uh, executive, legislative, and, and judiciary, and I say this as a former head of OCR, an agency that more than any others uh, has uh, issued uh, guidance that has built whole doctrines of the law that are not anchored uh, in anything said or done by, by Congress. Um, uh, and third, because much of the time when administrative agencies are untethered, uh, they develop regulations that reduce individual freedom. Having said that, two things that make me maybe less fully sold than my smarter conservative friends. First, the notion that everyone seems to agree with that the legislative is popularly elective, whereas the executive branch is not, strikes me as being somewhat overstated. Um, after all, uh, bills are not all written by elected members of Congress. Uh, let's be real, it's usually unelected staff or more frequently the special interests who sell, send them the bills, right? Whereas on the other hand, when regulations are drafted in the bureaucracy, the president, of course, is the head of that branch. Um, and the um, executive branch has people who are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. It's not always obvious that there's less democratic legitimacy to something done by a Senate-confirmed person as opposed to by a, a congressional staff person. Second, it is not true in my view that in every case uh, regulations reduce freedom. In some cases, they simply provide greater transparency about what government is doing. And when regulations or guidance is rescinded, in some cases there are rule of law problems, when uh, government officials, unelected government officials, therefore exercise arbitrary power, continuing to engage in enforcement, but without clear rules that are set in advance. So I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry for being ornery. I would say that in terms of the themes that both of you brought, I largely agree, but, I, but I, I, I'm not 100% convinced in the way that, that others are. So it, it looks like we might have uh, the seeds for a debate here. Uh, I think I'm going to let you guys respond and just have people ask questions after the event because I, I, do, I do want to see this. This is interesting. Well, I'll just say, to be clear, I'm skeptical that um, the attack on the Chevron doctrine or, or some sort of revival of non-delegation doctrine is really possible. I think there is inevitably going to be some uh, deference to um, bureaucrats. And uh, so I'm not sure that, uh, that there's that much um, disagreement uh, between Ken and me. Okay. I mean, my own, my own view is that, you know, there are perhaps policy and outcome reasons to favor um, major questions doctrine or getting rid of Chevron deference. But ultimately, I think, at least with regards to major questions doctrine, it's actually not about whether that's going to be good or bad for liberty. I just think it is a normal interpretive canon that gets you at the, it's It's a way of understanding language. It's legitimate in and of itself. And that's what Justice Barrett was writing her separate opinion, right? To say this isn't about the outcome. It's not about... Uh, a judge-made doctrine that's going to lead to to one thing or another or any policy reasons. It's just the way that we understand language. And I think the same with, with Chevron. It's wrong because it's wrong. It's not that we're trying to get rid of it. I mean, it, I think it would lead to, to more liberty, and I'm all about judicial uh, primacy, um, so down with Chevron. But I also think it's just the the right answer. All right. Well, we have time for maybe two or three audience questions. Uh, let's see. Who has any?
Thank you. Um, my, my one sort of question, I appreciate all of your opinions. My one question is related to the uh, sort of trajectory of the court and the recent uh, conservative, I guess you could say, or originalist revival in the court is that in the uh, previous, most recent uh, nominations towards the Supreme Court, all the justices have basically been uh, appointed along sort of partisan lines in Congress, right, where whoever the president is will appoint a justice and then it'll go to Congress and then Congress will, you know, the Republicans will vote for Kavanaugh, the Democrats will reject him, or, you know, maybe one or two might switch, but it, it's become very uh, partisan as opposed to you go to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I believe it was only two uh, senators out of three, <laughs> thank you, um, that voted against her nomination. So I'm wondering, do you think that this root problem, because I, I believe it is a problem, if you don't think it's a problem, please uh, let me know, but is this problem because the candidates that the presidents are nominating are not uh, partisan, I mean uh, bi bipartisan enough, or do you think that it's a result of there's no way that somebody could appeal to both sides anymore because we've become so uh, polarized in Congress. Well, this is in my wheelhouse to be made. Uh, look, there's a <laughs> deep divide on, uh, on legal philosophy f uh, between the left and the right, and the parties have increasingly over the last 30 years defined themselves on those grounds. So you had you know, very liberal Republicans back in the 80s who just don't exist anymore and you have conservative Democrats who are much smaller in number. Uh, it is, um, I, I disagree with you that it's a bad thing. Um, I mean, I obviously wish that, that, um, that everyone embraced the, um, the, the wisdom of originalism and textualism, uh, uh, but uh, since they don't, we need to have these fights. And the only reason we have the court we have is because we've had these fights and won these fights. There is no going back. I was, I was a staffer. I handled the Ginsburg and Breyer nominations. I was the lead staffer on those. I saw Republicans roll over and play dead and not fight on judicial philosophy. That approach gets you nowhere. Uh, so um, uh, no, we, we've had to have these fights, and um, uh, I'm glad that, that we have won them. And I um, see no way of going back, and I wouldn't want to. All right, let's see if we can get a few more. Can, can I say something real quick on that? So I don't think it's the nominee's fault, but maybe I'm just self-interested having been nominated. <laughs> so, um, and having been confirmed on a straight line vote. Um, so my experience is that uh, senators from the other party would sometimes say really nice things about me, including one of them uh, publicly uh, at, a, at a hearing, um, but then vote against. Um, and, and I can't blame them. Um, I was nominated for you know, a fairly sensitive, controversial uh, position. Um, it would have been dangerous for a Democratic senator to confirm in a, in a position like that. Um, so I think that a, a lot of what's happening in these votes isn't even each senator making up their, their own mind, but really not being able to make up their own mind because car partisan considerations have been so uh, entrenched. Uh, first of all, thank you guys so much for coming. Yeah, so my question is about, um, so you were talking about affirmative action, like sort of after the SFFA decisions and kind of whether or not this will result in like change in university policies. So what I'm wondering about though is like with the essays, on the one hand, it seems to make sense like to allow race considerations and essays just like as a story of merit. But on the other hand, like I, I wonder, like how is it that uh, courts and legis like are supposed to police uh, universities kind of taking advantage of this opportunity uh, and kind of just sort of using like a, other than maybe like exact like sort of exactly reproduced results of like the same quotas as before really hard to do with a lot of case-by-case -case work and some uh, major discovery battles so definitely expensive litigation I think what you just said is one I mean look to see whether they have r replicated very closely the results after as were before uh, and show how it's inconsistent with the express language of the uh, of the SFFA um, uh, opinion I also think that some who support um, policies inconsistent with the Supreme Court's decision feel so self-confident in their positions that they're saying things indiscreetly in uh, emails that will come up in, in, uh, in discovery. And there are other ways of, of doing it. Now, 
it, the fact is, it's maddling, maddeningly difficult to figure out what the right way is to do it. Presumably, if two students um, talk about their resiliency, one uh, after a car accident or based on a disability, and the other one based on racial discrimination, uh, presumably under the law, you can consider the resiliency issue for either one of them, and you shouldn't say, well, because one of them was discrimination, the other was something else, we'll treat them differently. But how can you really figure that out when you're looking at the, at the essays, unless there's sort of some sort of uh, uh, admission? My sense is that it, college can admission- I, Can I interrupt you on that? Because sure. I think there's an answer. I mean, uh, univers college admissions offices don't monitor how many students have accepted who have been in automobile accidents. And they shouldn't be monitoring on a going forward basis um, the admissions office should be monitoring the, the race or ethnicity of applicants or those who are accepted. If they are monitoring, they're doing so for a reason. They're doing so in order to roughly replicate what they see as the ideal um, percentage. So I agree with you, but here's how you can lose. Um, you, no, in a case, I mean, uh, in, you, can, you can lose because there are in uh, the government contracts uh, context and elsewhere places where it's explicitly said that you can use, uh, you can look at race in order to see whether you need to uh, see whether you are discriminating or not discriminating, right? Um, the new OCR um, guidance, perhaps we think it's unconstitutional, uh, says you can you can use uh, targeted um, uh, recruitment. Now we might think that's unconstitutional, but we don't know what the court would say about it. So a college could say, and I think that some of them are abandoning it. I think that the smart, good faith ones are abandoning the uh, uh, data gathering and the monitoring. But if they don't, Yale, Yale abandoned it. If they don't, yes, that's right. Yale abandoned it in response to a lawsuit, right, as a part of a settlement. <laughs> So if they, if they don't get sued and they don't abandon it, what they'll say is, we're not using this data in order to discriminate. We're using this data to make sure that we don't discriminate and to make sure that we can use non-discriminatory outreach. So it's still tricky. If I could also suggest another possible enforcement mechanism. And, uh, there's a uh, federal law called the False Claims Act that allows private individuals to sue um, uh, for false claims that have been submitted to the government and re recover a huge percentage of, of the recovery. And let's say that Yale um, uh, receives $500 million a year uh, from the federal government uh, certifying under Title VI that it complies with laws prohibiting discrimination on the basis of race. And some admissions officer sitting in on meetings happens to know that discrimination has been occurring. I think, I think there could be some admissions officers who could be in a great position to provide the evidence that can otherwise be so, hard, so difficult to, to elicit. So I think I, I'm, I'm more of an optimist uh, here than some. Uh, look, um, there's, there can be stuff that can be done in the margins, but I think, this, I think these things can be exposed uh, and the, the court's um, uh, ruling can have a sweeping effect. Yeah. All right. I think we have time for one last question. Uh... Thank you. Uh, this is for Ms. Uh, or Mrs. Bowden. You've looked at dissents throughout history, and there have been some particularly scathing ones even back in the day. But do you think that there is an increase in the, the number or the intensity of dissents? I mean, I, I, I think of several that really do attack like the, the justices. And it seems to me more so than it used to be. Have you noticed a, a trend over time, or is it kind of similar? I mean, I don't, I don't think they've gotten um, more hostile. I mean, one of the greatest dissenters, right, was Justice Scalia. Um, and, and he always said that you have to be able to attack ideas, not people. And I think maybe people have gotten more sensitive, but I don't think the critiques have gotten any more vigorous. I think, um, you know, there's just a lot more talk about how, how everything's nasty in culture. But in fact, you know, the Supreme Court is really actually one of the last bastions, I feel, of civility in our culture. And, um, and I do think that these debates, though heated, are often incredibly civil. Um, and you know, as everyone I think who knows anything about the Supreme Court knows, for for example, Justice Scalia and Justice Ginsburg were the greatest of friends, right? And in fact, there's a very good podcast episode about that on a podcast called Dist. I highly recommend it. Five stars only. Please tell your friends. Um, and it talks about this and about how uh, uh, actually dissent within the court should be a model of civility to the rest of society and a place where we can get to that. Um, idea of attacking ideas and not people. If 
if I may, there's also a book <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> by right. the name of Scalia Speaks, which I had the privilege of co-editing, which ha features a foreword by uh, Justice Ginsburg discussing her friendship with Justice Scalia and includes a speech by Justice Scalia celebrating what was then uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's 10th anniversary on the DC circuit. Well, why don't we give our guests a round of applause. Thank you all for coming.